Coming up on Theater Talk. I believe that any musical, no matter how great it is, is really a ship going forward only slightly faster than it's sinking. And <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. Now, I've been to uh, a lot of opening nights on Broadway, but to me, the most exciting remains the opening night of a musical called Titanic. And you were at that, that show with me. That's right. And I'll never forget, this was a show that uh, had some struggles in previews, and the expectations were kind of low. But that opening night, by the end of that show, Everybody in my row, including Lauren Bacall and the writer Peter Stone, who wrote the show, were in tears, That's and right. Susan Haskins That's as right. well. Right. The music, the score, is one of the greatest written for the stage, and I'm very happy tonight to have my favorite Broadway composer, Maury Estin, who wrote not only Titanic, but another musical that made me fall in love with the theater, Nine, which I saw when I was about 12 years old, Maury, which I'll never forget, another great show, Grand Hotel, and A Phantom of the Opera which has a beautiful score as well. Thank you. Thanks. Great to be here. Two-time Tony Award winner and great, great friend of ours. Well, Maury, welcome yes. to Theater Talk. Well, I see you brought your piano with you. Yes, I did. It was, uh, we, it was hard getting it in the front door, but we got it. <laughs> but you got it in. Um, Maury, this is going to be a show about your life in the theater and all the great shows that you wrote. Um, let's start with Nine, because that was the one that I saw as a kid. And Good the movie's way. out now. Good one to start with. It was your idea yes. to, to take Eight and a Half and turn it into this musical. Yep. Where did that sense, that idea come from? Well, you know, uh, I was very lucky. I, I, I wanted to write shows ever since. The first two shows I saw growing up as a kid were, the, were uh, My Fair Lady and Guys and Dolls. I mean, My Fair Lady, I saw Rex and Julie. So, I mean, if that's how you're starting, <laughs> um, I, I knew I wanted to do this. Um, we won't even talk about what college and growing up. And we'll get to that. The, but the, the point was that that's what I wanted. And when I was about 17 years old, I saw this fantastic Fellini movie. In those days, you went and see, saw all the art films. And I fell in love with that film for a, a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which was that it was about a guy in, in sort of crisis and a crisis of identity. And when you're, an, when you're an adolescent, you identify with that. Adolescence. And I just loved it and adored it. And later on, I was in the BMI Music Theater Workshop run by Lehman Engel. And boy, what a, a, what a group that was. There was like Ed Kleban was sitting over here and Alan Macon was sitting over there. And he was teaching us how to write shows and how to write lyrics. And uh, the second year, he said, start a project. And don't worry about whether you'll ever get to get it on. You're, you're writing to keep your pencil sharp. And that was the project I wanted. I wanted to dearly turn into a piece of musical theater. Mm -hmm. And I just started writing it. What was the first song you wrote for Nine? The first song I wrote for Nine was Nine. That was the reason I loved that movie. There's a scene in the middle of that movie when the little eight or nine-year-old boy, the young Guido, uh, the main character, is being taken out of a, a bath uh, as a child by his mother and his aunts and his grandmother along with the other little boys. And they're being swaddled affectionately in gigantic Italian sheets and dried and and, and, and put to bed. And it, it's an image of an absolute unconditional female love um, of, of, of childhood, absolute security. You can see that these women are a buffer against anything difficult in the world. And I, I so loved that moment. That was the, my way into the piece, mm -hmm. what, what women meant to this young boy. And I, I later discovered that that was probably the, the place where he, he stopped emotionally growing. Yeah. And he kept wanting women to be that for him. But of course, you, you do have to grow up. Will and you play us the first song? Well, you wrote? that was for nine. Yep. It's, he hears the voice of his mother from the past. Guido, caro mio, time to come out of your bed. Wrap you up in a mother's love. Take a towel and dry your little hand. Time to come out in the air. Sleepy pup in your mother's arms. Plant a kiss on your lips and cry. 
put you to bed. Night, Guido. Happy birthday to you. The song continues celebrating his birthday until he finally time to come out of your arms don't conceal what you feel let it shine that you'd like to be always nice. what did Lehman Engel say when you played that song for him he he wept. Really? He wept. And you know, in those days, you know, you would you would you would write a song and you'd come in, you'd just play it for the class. Yeah. And and Layman would say either well everybody if everybody's looking down and looking at the weave on the carpet, obviously you haven't done it right. <laughs> uh, but he but you know, but when you did well, he would just shake his head and say, Well, that is just absolutely beautiful and then he would make he would make suggestions. Mm. Um and then, of course, if somebody else did a song like that, or you, everybody just wanted to come in the next week and have a winner, just like that. It was, <laughs> it was wonderful. But that was that was the way into that was the way into that character. Uh, and it, I, I think everything, everything about my growth as a, as a writer is really learned through writing. I don't think you can teach writing, but you learn it by writing. Mm -hmm. And and I think that was that was one of the examples of learning from Lehman how it is that a song has to, a theater song has to be at point B, having started at point A by the end of the song, otherwise it's not a, a theater song. It doesn't go. And that song starts with the little boy coming out of the bath and ends with an extraordinary revelation of the character of the adult, as well as the boy, not to mention the fact that the man and his past Ch child of his are, are on stage at the same time, which is intensely theatrical mm. and very close to what Fellini wanted to do in his film in the first place, which was to depict the world of, of the future, uh, of, of the present and the past, and, 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 uh, and fantasy at the same time. All in his mind. So it was my way in at the now, project. Th of course, the great uh, concept of Nine was that you got rid of all the male characters from eight and a half, Absolutely. except the little boys, and had. Guido Contini surrounded by he was surrounded all the by, women. by women, and that was a, that was uh, that was the kind of thing that was a, a wonderful happy accident that you have to keep aware of all the time because these shows change constantly. The show is never ever ever the same, yeah. uh, n and until finally it opens. I mean, and when Jerome Robbins says musicals are never finished, they're merely abandoned for lack of time. <laughs> that's absolute true. I believe that any musical, no matter how great it is, is really a ship going forward only slightly faster than it's sinking. And <laughs> you get there through smoke and mirrors and fixing it all the time, and you're constantly tinkering it and, and, and constantly working on it. And there are principles, like really important principles. Um, but but, but that's, that's one of them is staying ahead of the audience, uh, because once they can predict what you're doing, they're going to be bored. Right. Right. Now, uh, there's a song in Nine that I also think is an, sort of an ex excellent example of a character study. Um, Only With You, which is not in the movie, uh -huh. but it's one of my favorite songs in the show. It was shot for the film. It was shot for I the film. I think it will probably be on the DVD. On the DVD. Yeah. But I love that song. If you could just sort yeah. of play that first and explain well, to sure. us well, the, I think the I genesis can get through of that it, but song. Yeah, but the yeah. genesis of that song was really the, 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 the show. Uh, very early, you hear a song called Guido's Song, yeah. which is about this, the main character who really wants everything. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, like a, a, a sort of Aristotelian. And everything in moderation, but everything. Can you yeah. give us a little you know? sense of Guido's Well, thought? actually, that one of the things that I learned from that very, very early on was was the whole idea of that characterizes my music, which is the piano or the orchestra becomes a, a major character in the song, mm. terribly important. Mm. And for me, it was that was just his initial character and, and a leitmotif that tells you who he is. Uh, <laughs> Just that little spark that goes off in him all the time. And it's almost like when, when we first meet Guido, he's surrounded by reporters. He can't answer any questions. He's going out of his mind. He's oh, gone away to a spa with his wife. His mistress has shown up unannounced. And he's finally, and his, his producer, who he's running away from, has said, I'm coming there tomorrow. And he's just got to get rid of everybody. And basically, he says, you know, please, no, you know, we'll have a press conference later on. It's almost like toys falling out of a closet, you know? Yeah. 
Finally, he's alone. I would like to be here. I would like to be there. I would like to be everywhere at once. I know that's a contradiction in terms, and it's a problem. Especially when my body's clearing 40, as my mind is nearing 10. That becomes Guido's song. <laughs> the other thing that happens in that song is I had been so uh, in love with the idea of counter melody, the idea of doing big numbers on stage in which one part of the cast is singing one thing and another part of the cast is singing something against it. As, for example, in the Grand Canal, uh, uh, somebody is singing, this is the Grand Canal, and then somebody else is singing, row me. And I, thought, and I had done it so, in so many different ways in the Germans at the spa. Yeah. I thought, well, why can't I do a counter melody with one person singing his own counter melody. And that's where Guido says, you know what, I'm not enough for myself. I gotta have two of me. And then he sings, I would like to be here. Sing along with myself and this will to be there. I'm walking down the lane now, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. That's a contradiction in terms of I want to be here with a counter. So he's already bifurcated or trifurcated. He, he wants everything. And despite the fact that he knows that he can't have it, he's still frustrated that he can't want it. Right. And he is a serial monogamist. Yes, he is a son of a Yes, he is cheating on his wife and on his mistress, but he's deeply in love with each of three women when he's with each of three women. Uh, there's and his wife, there's his mistress, and there's a an actress, Claudia, who is his muse and his inspiration. And that's when that's he sings. Being just me is so easy to be when I'm only with you. And obviously this is his wife. Open inside and with nothing to hide from your view. Seems long ago I was destined to know and the moment I saw you I knew I could be totally happy with no one but you. And in his mind his mistress shows him. Passionate night after passionate night, and he sings that, and finally his, the actress shows up, and it's giving you chase like some goddess of grace. I pursue, and the song ends. No, small wonder it seems that my life's made of dreams and of wishes that never come true. I wouldn't be lonely if I could be only with. Music, there's a great European influence into it. What in this your... particular, in, in this score, yes, absolutely so. Yeah. And what is, where does that come from in your background? I think it's, I think it's twofold. I think, well, threefold. Well, my dad's from London originally, mm -hmm. and so he, growing up, he sang tons of uh, English music hall songs. Uh -huh. uh, he had his business uh, in Montreal, and when I was very little boy, three and four and five and six. Uh, we would spend a couple of weeks each summer in the Laurentians, uh, just in little farmhouses in Quebec, and the ra no television. The radio was on all the time, and it was just PF, 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 Chevalier, Chevalier, Chevalier. And I thought I was a little French kid. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of French influence I in my work. And then I think through studying classical music, and more particularly my baby boomer generation, what you did was, is, uh, you know, if you went to college, the college would uh, lease an airplane and you'd go to Europe for three months on five dollars a day. And that's when I, th I think everything that I learned about Germany and France and Italy and England, that became nine. That, my musical autobiography, and it's all in there. Now, we put this picture <laughs> up yes. of you going back to your childhood. Oh, I see myself right there. Uh, that's, th that's the second front. That, yep, second, that's right. The, the little five-year-old with the... You look with, like a little German With child. the blonde <laughs> hair. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the little toe-headed boy. There now, I what, am. Now, um, what camp is this called? This is, you... called, this is Camp Stissing Lake in Pine Plains, New York, mm -hmm. and I'm... I'm you know, honestly, it was quite an issue because in those days they just sent you away even before you were five, you know, for two months. And they forgot to tell me I, I was coming home. So I just thought you live with your parents for four years and then you go off someplace where they spray a lot of DDT. Uh, but <laughs> what's interesting about it, if you just look up and to the left, you'll see one of the senior camp counselors, Jerry Herman. His parents are either, are either side of him and he was, they owned the camp. 
And his mother... That's Ruth Herman, the famous Ruth. I remember her like it was yesterday. She was a member of the Hadassah in Jersey City, and she had the most fantastically powerful voice. She, was, she, she, she could sing. When she sang the moon, When the Moon Comes Over the Mountain, yeah. she was Kate Smith plus Ethel Merman. The walls shook. And I hear her voice in Jerry's music still today. Was this a musical um, theater camp? No, it wasn't. Said? No, this was just a, 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 a local camp from, you know, I should... Forgive my parents. I mean, in those days, they got you out of the city because there was a terrible fear of polio. Mm -hmm. and, and you just, you know, just get, went out to the countryside. But he was writing music then, and I was writing music then. You were I, writing music oh, when yeah, you absolutely. Were... I had started playing the piano before I was five, and my mother started teaching me. She, she had learned piano, and I, I started writing music immediately. Do you, can you play us something you wrote when you I, were I a won an award. I won an award at the local community <gasps> center. It was an award for, uh, for something called Hebrew Melody. Well, how can you play that? <laughs> it went play... like this. Yeah. Hebrew melody. It does. Yeah, well, you, you know what? It's really funny. <laughs> but I have been told so a lot of people. That's you know, Maury, people say to me sometimes, no matter what, even in comedy material, I, I, I sense there's a streak of melancholy in your music. <laughs> well, obviously, Hebrew <laughs> it must have started there. <laughs> but uh, honestly, there are so many Broadway composers who have a cantor in their background. My mother's father, my grandfather, was a, was a Jewish Orthodox ca cantor. And I think Kurt Weill had a cantor, uh, either father, grandfather, Irving Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that even before you can walk, you're carried in your mother's arms into a very big room. It's Yom Kippur. You don't know that. There's a man on stage in a costume. <laughs> He's singing in a huge tenor voice to everybody, shaking the walls. Everybody else is singing with him. And honestly, to walk into a theater and have somebody stand on stage, you just take that as being normal. That's musical theater. That's, so, yeah, and so, you, uh, not to mention the fact that he's expressing everybody's emotions for them. <laughs> Perhaps there's something to that. Now, speaking of these Hebrew melodies, you, <laughs> you've written a Bible show. Well, uh, yeah, that was actually, again, that was the next project. I mean, you need to understand, no, we never thought that any of the things that we were writing in the workshop were ever going to get produced. So nine was just an oh, exercise. Please, of it was course. not going to be Yeah, so yet. after writing nine, I thought, okay, my next project, I'm going to write a musical based on the first five books of the Bible. I'll call it one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> it was about numbers in those days. But, and I thought, I had this idea, it uh, was a sort of not really the thousand-year-old man or the Mel Brooksian idea, but it's sort of my own idea, probably having gone to a parochial school, that, that, that uh, I, I wanted to feel guilt-free about the Bible. And I thought, well, what about if there was a family of ordinary people, just like all of us, living next door to all the major stars of the Bible? And whatever happened to the big shots happens to us, not even our fault. <laughs> and I, I had... Begun to write, and I eventually convinced Larry Gelbart to Great Larry write it Gelbart. with me, and we and and we did it, and and uh, oh, I don't know, it just sort of something about it just didn't click. Did it uh, ever get on? Did it yeah, ever? well, we did it at the Manhattan Theater Club for a little while, and it was uh, it was just it was I thought it was really great, but uh, it didn't move from there, and magically nobody reviewed it. I, somehow my agent, God bless her, Flora Roberts, yeah, yeah. managed to convince everybody not to review it. She said it's not ready yet, and they're just trying it out. But uh, one of the songs that came from it uh, is, is a song called New Words. Mm. And, and that, that song became quite, um, I guess, quite, quite something as a result of Would that. Would you uh, yeah. give us New I Words? I would be very happy to do that. Um, is there any setup for this? No, there's no, the whole point of this song is that there's no setup for this. <laughs> Above us in a sky of blackest silk. See how round, like a cookie. See how white, as white as milk. Call it the moon, my son. Say moon. Sounds like your spoon. My son, can you say it? A new word today. Say moon. Near the moon, brightly turning 
see the shining sparks of light each one new each one burning through the darkness of the night we call them stars my son say stars that one is mars my son can you say it new word to Say stars as they blink all around us, playing starry-eyed games. Who would think it astounds us, simply naming their names? From the skies now, turn around and look at me. There's a light in my eyes now, and a word for what you see. We call it love, my son. Say love. So hard to say. My son, it gets harder. New words today we'll learn to say. Learn, move, learn, stars, learn. Beautiful, Gorgeous. beautiful. Did you ever have a, a, a lyricist writing partner, or were you always Never. from the beginning writing music? Never. In the workshop, well, I had I had I had uh, written, uh, auditioned with some of some of uh, my own works, and there were two people in that general group who Layman said, "I don't think I want to pair you with a lyricist. I, I think you should I should develop you as your own lyricist." And it was me and Ed Cleban. Wow. Mm. And I think he just Layman was brilliant that way, and I think he just uniquely understood. That that the music and the words were so intimately linked with the way we thought mm. that it would be a better idea for him to school us hmm. uh, as lyricists and uh, because we both actually came in as composers. What's harder for you to do, the music or the lyrics? It's all the same. It's all. It's yeah. all. The, the truth is, it's the premise. The, it's the premise is the everything of it, mm. and, and 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 that's what's interesting me, to me about it. I w I want to write a song that's a kind of song that's never been written before. And the only way to do that is to put yourself in impossible situations where you can't do anything. A grand hotel is a, a case in point. I mean, there, there was David Carroll, and we had to make the 30-something-year-old David Carroll fall in love with Lillian Montevecchi, who was a good bit older, and there he was trapped in her, her hotel room, and she discovered him. He was, he was stealing her jewels. And she comes in, and she, says, she surprises him, and she says, what are you doing here? And, and, and he says, I, I'm here to breathe the air that you breathe. Well, Peter Stone and I had been brought up to fix that show. They were in trouble. And, and so I said to Stone, probably what we need, because we both did everything. I yeah. said, you know what? She needs to pick up the phone and she needs to say, if you can't come up with a better line than that, I'm calling, I'm going to have the police. Throw and, you out. <laughs> and then he says, a better line than that. But the problem is, how can I have him fall in love with her in instantly? And the answer to that was something that we learned from Layman Engel, which was is that you go to the opposite. You know, you, you or you just you. It's an, it really isn't possible for him to fall in love. And you know, if if you can't solve a problem in a musical theater, write a song about it. And, and what was the song? That's you what happens. He goes, uh, Mademoiselle, I have followed you everywhere, always throughout your career. She's a ballerina, London, Vienna, Paris. I've admired you, hoping one day we might meet in this way. Oh, I knew you'd be beautiful, but not so beautiful. Love can't happen quite so quick. Not unless I dream you beautifully and sweetly. No, don't 
Look at me so clearly I might very nearly Lose myself completely Who could ever have suspected I would be here trembling so I can't think of any answer Other than if love comes When love comes you A beautiful song that stopped the show every single night in Grand Hotel. Uh, listen, Maury, we've only scratched the surface, so will you stick around for another segment? We're going to talk about Grand Hotel and how you fix a show that's in serious trouble out of town in previous. Not to mention your own show. Because <laughs> this man is the expert. So uh, stay with us. Uh, join us next week, I should say, on Theater Talk with Maury Estes. Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>